and I want to welcome everybody to the virtual voucher con. I'm so excited because I, I thought this was just going to be oh uh, just um, us reading books in our rooms, but it's not. So it's wonderful to be able to spend time with you, and um, it's really great to visit just wearing makeup and no shoes. So everybody's comfortable, be comfortable. We're, we're going to have a great time here. So um, my name is Cheryl Holland and I um, write full time. After an engineering career designing and installing military flight simulators all over the world, uh, England, Wales, Australia, Singapore, Taiwan, and India. So I combine my love of writing with a passion for creating art in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I write two series. I write uh, a stained glass series set in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I write a series of uh, paint and shine mystery painting. And it's set in Eastern Kentucky. And I'm going to have a curious fact for each one of them, one of our panelists. And mine is, I was a Boy Scout leader and have trained Scoutmasters for the Tampa Bay Area Boy Scouts of America. So I'm a card-carrying Boy Scout. So um, first, Tony Berry's dream of becoming an archaeologist ended when she learned there was more to it than discovering the tombs of lost pharaohs. Instead, she created the Kate Hamilton mystery series set in the UK and featuring an American antiques dealer with a gift for solving crimes. Her curious fact, Connie was once hired as a writer for a European travel guide. Two weeks later, the publication went out of business. So yeah. Traditional publishing, wonderful. So Connie, give us your one minute elevator pitch of your book. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> My latest book is called A Legacy of Murder, and um, it's set in Suffolk, England. What could be lovelier than Christmas in England? American antique dealer Kate Hamilton arrives in the village of Long Barston, dreaming of falling snow, log fires, and Tom Mallory, the detective inspector she met recently in Scotland. She is also looking forward to spending time with her daughter, who is an intern at Finchley Hall, a crumbling Elizabethan manor house owned by Lady Barbara Finchley Ford. Festive spirits end when the body of an intern, a young antiquities curator, is found floating in Blackwater Lake. When a second intern is attacked, Kate begins her own investigation. Her own daughter could be next. What she finds points backward in time to an Anglo-Saxon treasure trove, a missing blood red ruby ring, and a 400 year old legacy of murder. Thank you, Connie. Uh, next, Kristen lived in New York City and Nantucket, two islands which inspire her imagination at every step. After a career in marketing, the Nantucket Candle Maker Mysteries Mark Christian's debut as an author. Curious fact. <laughs> Speaking of scouts, Kristen is looking forward to working this month with a Girl Scout troop in Staten Island, which is filled with aspiring mystery writers. Kristen? Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me here today. Um, my latest book in the Nantucket Candlemaker Mysteries, it came out in August is 15 minutes of flame and um, once again Stella Wright our uh, candle maker and businesswoman who owns a, the store the Wiccan Flame on Center Street in town is at it again um, this book starts when she is uh, helping the Girl Scouts of Nantucket prepare for their Halloween haunts event um, can you tell I was a troop leader at one point um, and, and interestingly, like Connie's, uh, I think the past and the present meet, um, and in uh, preparing for the event, she actually uh, discovers the 
body of a young Quaker woman who had been um, murdered and buried in, in, um, in this house where the event is taking place. And in um, seeking answers and, and investigating this old murder, um, a present day murder um, occurs as well. And so she is on the trail of the two murders this time around. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, next, Hannah. Hannah Dennison is British born. She originally moved to Los Angeles to pursue screenwriting. She has been an obituary reporter antique dealer, private jet flight attendant, and Hollywood story analyst. She now lives in the UK with her two Hungarian Basalis. How do you say that? Oh, Vizhlas. Vizhlas, okay. <laughs> I don't, they're pronounced differently everywhere, I think. <laughs> <laughs> a curious fact, uh, Hannah interviewed world champion snail racer, Neil Rivero, who appeared on Britain's Got Talent. Oh, there's a story, but it's your book. <laughs> I will just one, say one quick thing about the snails though. The, the, well, the Guinness Book of Records is that the, it's, it's 13 inches, a snail travels 13 inches in two minutes, 20 seconds, just in case anyone's interested. That's why it didn't do very well in Britain's Got Talent. Um, anyway, so this is my new book, um, a new series called Death at High Tide. It's the Island Sisters Mysteries. Um, I also write the Honeychurch Hall Mysteries, so this is a brand new series for me. Um, it's set in a very small fictional island off the coast of uh, southwest England called the Isles of Scilly. I made up the, uh, the island, which I know we'll talk about later. Uh, it's about two sisters. Um, one sister's just been recently widowed and she learns that not only has her husband, who was a lot older than her, um, left her virtually penniless, he actually also left her this mysterious potential hotel. So her sister, who actually lives in Los Angeles, odd that, you know, I'm in all my stories, um, flies back to be with her sister Evie and they go out to the hotel um, and this is where lots of, uh, they have lots of adventures. Um, it turns out that there's a, a whole small cast of characters there, a couple of murders, um, um, but most of all it's about, about being sisters and the dynamics of family with a bit of murder thrown in, which is probably what happens with families, right? But anyway, mm. so that's, uh, this is my first book in this new series. Oh, well done, thank you. Um, Barbara is the author of the main clam bake mystery series and the Jane Darrowfield Mysteries. Her books have been nominated for multiple Agatha Awards for Best Contemporary Novel and have won the main literary award for crime fiction. Curious fact. As a waitress, she served Truman Compote every Monday during the summer of 1974. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so give us your pitch. It was awesome, I must say. I kept his, an Amex with his signature on it, a carbon in my wallet for decades <laughs> until it fell apart. And I'm sure neither the restaurant nor Truman would have been very happy about that, but So how about your new book, your, um, pitch your new one? Yeah, so I'm, uh, this is Jane Darrowfield and the Mad Woman Next Door, the second in my new Jane Darrowfield Professional Busybody series. Jane is a woman who in retirement has a second career as a professional busybody, fixing things for friends and neighbors that are too small to uh, or inappropriate to take to the police. This new one starts when her next door neighbor comes down her garden path and knocks on her door and says, I want you to figure out if I'm crazy. Thank you. So Tara is the international and USA Today best-selling author of contemporary fiction that explores what goes on beneath the surface of seemingly perfect lives. Her latest novel is The Favorite Daughter, and it earned a Publishers Weekly Star Reviewed and spent three weeks on the Canadian hardcover bestsellers list. 
and is out in paperback um, in April. Fun fact, she loves to hula hoop and play pickleball, though not at the same time. So unmute yourself and um, give us your tip. Thanks, Cheryl. Hi, everybody. Um, I think I'm the only one that doesn't have a series, which <laughs> makes it hard to set up here. But I, um, the, yeah, my latest is The Favorite Daughter, also back here. And um, I tend to write about couples who, um, adults who are behaving badly. And in this case, in The Favorite Daughter, this would be um, a story about Jane. And she has had a tragic loss in her family and um, her, her oldest daughter passed away mysteriously. And she's decided she has to get re-engaged in the family, get back in charge. And so she um, gets back involved. And it, it, my stories usually happen over a course of maybe a weekend or uh, in this case, three days in best day ever on a day. And it's really hard to talk about them because if I tell you too much more, typically I will give something away. But the uh, whole point is she is probably not what she seems and so I like to write um, unreliable narrators who um, try to distract you. She uses dark humor and likes to tell you about weird ways people can die in their homes. So anyway, enough about that. <laughs> Happy to be here with you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, now our topic is far away building a fictional town. So every story is set somewhere sometimes completely fictional, sometimes disguised. And even if an author places the setting in an actual town, ooh, we frequently change things up, either to increase the tension, shorten the drive, or in my case, bring back a favorite pub that's no longer there. So, but it is in my world. So Connie, um, why did you choose uh, Finchley Hall in, the, in Suffolk, England? for your second book in the series, rather than stay in Scotland like the first book. Uh, you're muted. Um, yeah, my, my first book was set on a fictional island in the Inner Hebrides. And the short answer is I pretty much killed everybody off on that island, so I had to go somewhere else. But uh, seriously, I always planned on um, the series ending up in Suffolk. I, I love Suffolk. It is so historic. Um, I love the Anglo-Saxon culture. So I always wanted to go there. And in order to get there, Kate had to meet someone from there, which is uh, Tom Mallory, detective inspector in the Suffolk Constabulary. But I wanted them to meet in a place where they were both outsiders. Um, a, a detective inspector would not normally include a civilian in his investigation. So I wanted them to meet in a place where they could kind of cooperate um, apart from the, the official police investigation. And that way he learned to really appreciate Kate's ability to notice details that other people don't and mostly to, to form connections where other people couldn't see them. And so now that they're together, um, while he doesn't share everything with her, obviously, he, he does rely on, on her instincts, and she does have a gift. Oh, thank you. Um, Kristen, uh, your books are set in Nantucket, and, uh, and why would that be? Um, well, Nantucket is an island. It's 30 miles off the coast of Massachusetts, so it's this little plot of land out in the middle of the ocean. Um, it's actually, I think, the easternmost part of the state. And um, I love this island personally. So it's just such a treat and an escape as a writer to, you know, spend a rainy day, which I have out my window. I don't know about you guys. Um, living in this wonderful, wonderful shingled, um, hydrangea filled coastal um, little island. Um, so selfishly, there was a reason to do it. Um, but also for Cozy Mystery, it's such a beautiful, wonderful community of people captured um, out at sea. Um, and it's filled with this vibrant in real life um, uh, local community. And then this sort of like the tides going in and out um, community of, of um, tourists, visitors um, who come and go. 
And I loved that dynamic um, for, for a mystery series. Um, visually, it's perfect for a mystery because it's a foggy island. It's the smells, the feel, the touch, every sense um, is just dripping with charm um, and, and a little bit of, of mystery. If you've ever been there, you'll know what I mean. Um, and then in terms of choosing it as a location for the Nantucket Candlemaker Mysteries, um, this island, which is well known as um, having a great history in, in the whaling industry, also was well known for, as a result of that, their candles. Um, and they were a huge part of the island's economy for, for um, years during the heyday of um, the whaling industry. And so it just fit perfectly. It was just a sort of kismet to kind of do it, you know, have it all be there. Um, thank you. Um, Hannah? Yes. Um, ah, now for something completely different. <laughs> Your setting is in a remote island just off the coast of Cornwall in the UK. Talk about closed off community. How, how does that feed the story? Um, well, I think at the beginning when I picked the Isles of Scilly I thought it I was told by a friend of my sister's that the only people come to a specific island there there are just five islands that are inhabited and then there are 142 little kind of rocks and stuff like that she said that people will go there because they're either hiding from someone or running away from something and I thought that was a great setup to have a mystery series but I, I think I wrote myself into a bit of a corner because I've made it so remote. Um, to get to the Silly Isles anyway, it's quite difficult from London. You, you have to take a, a, either a train, a plane, a ferry, a helicopter, a little boat. Um, it's, it's quite a far out. It's about 28 miles from, from actually the mainland. Um, and if you go by ferry, it, they call it, the locals call it the Great White Stomach Pump because the ferry makes everybody unbelievably sick because it's a flat bottom boat and it's almost a three hour journey. So that's, that's pretty far. So, um, so I have this island, this fictional island that's based on Tresco, which is one of the five islands and also Burr Island, which if uh, you watched um, uh, Agatha Christie's and then there were none, which was filmed recently with PBS, that was the location for Soldier Island. Um, which is off the coast of Devon. And so I put that island in the Scilly Isles, meaning that you could only access it by a causeway at tide, at the high tide. So that was fun for me to be able to get that kind of lock room mystery flavor. But I had to become very, very skilled at figuring out the tides and the high tides and how you can get on and off. And so that became sort of a whole mathematical kind of ordeal, actually. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's created a lot more suspense because obviously I've got a very small cast of characters. And I'm hoping in the future, because I have obviously another book coming out, that I'm going to avoid the Jessica Fletcher syndrome. <laughs> That's my biggest challenge. Um, or else it will just get bigger and bigger, like, um, you know, Harry Potter's Hogwarts, until I can include more and more people on, the, on my very tiny island. So, Thank you, Hannah. Um, Barbara, your main clam bake mysteries take place in fictional Busman's Harbor, and your Jane mysteries take place in a real place, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So why did you choose to do one fictional and one real setting and, and what's the difference when you're writing them? Hi, thank you. So Husband's Harbor, Maine, where my main clam bake mysteries take place, is only, to be completely honest, semi-fictional. It's based on Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, where my husband and I owned a house overlooking the harbor for many, many years. But Booth Bay Harbor is a small town. There are only about 3,000 people in the winter. And I really wondered how my neighbors and others would feel about me killing off masses of people in their town that depends on tourist dollars to survive. So I decided to make it a fictional place, which also allowed me to move things around the peninsula, bring things that were from other places into town. It avoids getting those emails you get from people that say, 
Main Street goes the other way from this block to that block, which are lovely, but really unnecessary in my life. So um, that was why I decided on a fictional town, because I really didn't want to kill too many of my neighbors. Uh, Jane Darrowfield, which was actually written before the main Clambake Mysteries, though published afterwards, takes place in a little island of Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's a little place cut off by three main roads, and it was all developed in the 1920s together, and it's oddly suburban, though the lots are small, in this sort of very dense city that is Cambridge. And uh, in the early years, my writers group met at the house of an author in that neighborhood. Um, she passed away about seven years into the group. And to me, it was just a loving tribute to her and that experience. Uh -huh. Though I have changed the map a little bit and renamed some of, some of the streets to protect the innocent. Thanks. Um, Kara, the next wife is described as a fast-paced suspense with characters you will love to hate. Tell us about them and your setting as well. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay, so my my settings tend to bounce between Columbus, Ohio and um, Southern California because those are the two places I've spent the most time. So in The Next Wife, I'm back in Columbus. That's where Best Day Ever was also set. Interestingly, listening to you guys, uh, Best Day Ever takes place for the most part in a Chautauqua community called Lakeside, Ohio, on the coast of Lake Erie. And I too liked the whole notion of setting something in this place that's idyllic and people go there to meditate and find God. And my um, person went there to probably do bad things. So I was really worried because I got a call from the Lakeside Chautauqua community uh, two summers ago, and they're, they're like, will you come speak to us? I'm like, oh, oh really? <laughs> You're not mad at me? So I got to go up there and um, flew there, and we did a golf cart tour of the plot, and I kind of pointed out, and people were like, oh, is that the cottage where Paul was? I'm like, oh, no, it's over here. It was really fun. A little loudspeaker, and there were like 40 golf cart people touring behind, so it was really fun. Anyway, back to the point. So my next book uh, <laughs> is The Next Wife, and the setup is the first wife who built a business with her husband. They have a beautiful daughter together. And then in comes the second wife, who is his administrative assistant. So when you, by the time you start reading, that's the whole setup. And again, I can't tell you much more. Just let me tell you that probably Kate, the first wife, isn't super pleased to have Tish, the second wife, around. <laughs> and there you have it. Thanks. Um, Connie, um, your protagonist is an American and even worse, a stranger to the village. So how did you take care, uh, how did you take advantage of, of that dynamic? Yeah, Kate is uh, definitely an outsider, and, and it's an interesting question. Um, this is a village where in order to be considered local, you almost have to trace your family back to the Doomsday Book, back um, toward the Norman invasion, but um, Kate is there, and um, she uh, actually, because she's an outsider, she is able to see things that the, that the locals aren't. They are so enmeshed in the history of the place and the, the personalities of everyone that there are a lot of things they miss. So Kate has a little bit of a bird's eye view, which gives her an advantage. Um, and then of course she is, you know, because of her skills as an antique dealer and appraiser, she has made some very important friends, one of them being um, Lady Barbara Finchley Ford. And of course, uh, she is becoming increasingly uh, friendly with Detective Inspector Tom Mallory. So that helps her there. But um, she hasn't won the hearts of everyone. And of course, that's what makes life interesting. Um, so Kristen, I'm always interested in where protagonists actually live. Um, so you chose a garage apartment for Stella. What, what, what drove that? <laughs> well, um, throughout this series, there are, so we know that the island of Nantucket is a real place, um, but there are definitely um, spaces within the island that just, you know, fit, um, 
the scene or the character, um, the circumstances that definitely are completely out of my imagination. Um, and I would add like, by, like Barbara, um, I didn't um, want, I didn't want to kill off people, you know, over and over again in a well-known space. So, for example, in my first book, um, Murder is No Vote of Confidence, the hotel at which the murder takes place is based on a real hotel I know of, but I completely recreated it. Stella's home is purely out of my imagination. It's not as if there's a house I know on the island and I think it would be perfect. I just thought it was really ideal for her, even who she is, to live in this garage apartment, which is actually on the property of her cousin, Chris. Stella is part of a huge family on the island. Everybody, everywhere you look, one of her family members is doing something. Chris is a contractor. He's very proud of this house that he um, restored. And it fits, it suits her um, love of family and friends that she would live nearby while she's building her business. Because at heart, she is a passionate young businesswoman. So the rent that she spends on a garage apartment is perfect for someone who would rather be investing and reinvesting every penny she makes into building um, her, her store out, her business, and creating and designing new candles for everyone who um, comes to visit the store. She always says, if you, can't, if you can't find something that's perfect for you, she'll make it for you and she'll find it. Um, so she has freedom by living in this humble garage apartment. Um, she dropped her bags there right out of college, never has left. By the end of 15 minutes of flame, she starts to think a little bit maybe about um, changing that setup. But uh, at the start, it was the perfect move for her. Thanks. Um, Hannah, I have a sister, and this is based on the relationship between sisters. You really nailed that. You must have a sister. So please tell us. Uh, I I do have a sister. Um, I have to be really, really clear that even though um, I've got the two sisters, Evie and Margot, Evie is, um, she wanted to be a photographer, but she got married and gave up her career for her husband. Evie's like 30, 36. Uh, and then her older sister, Margot, is the one who's an LA Hollywood producer. So both parts of those two characters are me. And I have to say that because my sister um, has not read any of my books ever. And um, I think she's nervous that I've actually written about her. Sometimes I might use some of her pet phrases because they're quite funny. Um, but it's so for the characters, the actual creation of the characters, they're both parts of myself, which I'm sure that all the other authors here always use them, their own, you know, um, experiences and stuff. But the dynamics of the sisters, um, I have actually drawn on that because um, I left England um, 25 years ago. And so uh, although we were close growing up, um, we were, there's only three years between us, um, she and I sort of drifted apart not because we wanted to, but back in the day, you know, there was no FaceTime or phone calls were really, really expensive. And so when I moved back uh, a couple of years ago, um, getting to know my sister again has been quite enlightening. It's quite interesting how when you have left the country for a long period of time, a lot of people remember you how you were when you left in your state of maturity or development. And so coming back as a different person who's had lots of different experiences is quite, is quite challenging at times. And also she's been through an awful lot of changes too. So we're, we're rediscovering each other as, as best, sister, best friends and sisters. And um, so it's been it's been kind of a, a really interesting time for me to explore certain things about that. Um, so that's I think maybe might touch on the realistic angle of it because uh, I do write about about that uh, about that sort of element. Thanks, um, Barbara. Um, your Jane investigations, I mean, really remind me of 
Alexander McCall Smith Precious and her number one ladies detective agency. And especially that little case of the switching hairdressers. Where does that come from? So I'm so pleased actually that you saw that influence in my in Jane Darrowfield. I love Alexander McCall Smith's books, particularly the number one Ladies Detective and the Scotland Street series. And in particular, I love the optimistic view of humanity and life that permeates those books. And I very much wanted it for my own. So that sort of explains um, the influence overall on the series. There was also an extremely practical reason. When I wrote the first book, I was, right, I was working very full time. And if you look at the early Alexander McCall Smith books in that series, they're very episodic. So instead of having a major personal and mystery arch that goes through the whole book, they tend to open a mystery and close it and open a mystery and close it. And when I was working very full time, I was like, well, I can do that. Um, <laughs> I can keep that in my head. So the book originally opened with five or six little episodes that explain Jane's path to becoming a professional busybody. And except for in tiny fragments, they're not in the final manuscript, but there, so there were, practical influences. As to changing hairdressers, um, that is so, I'm sitting here with my pandemic hair, but that is like such a fraught relationship, right? It's so intimate, yet it's a vendor, it's definitely a professional relationship, but it's also a personal relationship. Um, and I've never known how to leave a hairdresser. Um, and uh, I finally had to move. I had to move out of Boston to leave my hairdresser. So I thought that would be a good thing uh, for Jane to help one of her friends with, is breaking it to the hairdresser that she's moving to the person in the next chair. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, Kara, um, one of your advanced reviews uh, describe your book as Alfred Hitchcock meets Patricia Highsmith. Like, wow, but you have some explaining to do. How do those two mix? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, you know, as the outlier here, I just feel like what we do all have in common and what mysteries have in common is you need to build a place where to me setting comes first and even if my setting is um, and I like I'm a product of the suburbs and so my mysteries and, and domestic suspense tend to start with that premise and to me the suburbs are very can be very um, what is it claustrophobic and very full of people who also are keeping up with the Joneses right so to me that's always been like um, what really matters is sometimes pushed away and, and you get this kind of claustrophobia of like, what are they doing here in the next house over here? Same thing about writing in a lakeside Chautauqua community where even though the purpose of the community was go, to go to the lake and you know experience nature, in reality, you've got a bunch of people kind of close together. So I think we're all kind of in that you're building a, a world, you're building a place where you have to build the tension through the relationships of the people in that setting that you put it in. So I, I guess that's probably what the similarity between Alfred Hitchcock, I wish, I mean, it would be that, that you use setting and, and, and kind of like what you were saying, Cheryl, like I love restaurants. I used to, I remember going to restaurants, but back in the day when we could all go to restaurants, I always, I was a waitress as well. So I always have a real restaurant in my books, no matter what it is, even if they're not there anymore. To your point, so in Best Day Ever, there's this great um, like pizza joint up uh, there called Sloopy's, and so of course they go there. And in the favorite daughter, there's a restaurant right down here in Orange County, and 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 the next wife, my next book, there's a place called Lindy's that I always put in all my books because that's where I spent the most time waitressing, and it's actually still around, so that's nice. So I was reading through the questions coming up, but I think if you anchor your world that you're creating, whether it's for a series or a, well, a, just a standalone novel, if you have something that's familiar to you that kind of anchors your setting, even if it's all made up, just put, imagine like 
a restaurant you like or something like that and then ground it in that and then up the anxiety quotient. That'd be my advice. So we're um, coming up on uh, question and answer time, which is at about 1.15. But what I did want, while we're all together in this very unique situation, I wanted to segue to, you know, how has the pandemic affected you and your writing? And um, can we start with um, start with uh, Connie? Uh, well, I kind of hate to say it, but as far as writing is concerned, it's kind of my dream come true. My, my husband was uh, reminding me the other day that before the pandemic hit, I had said to him one time, oh, I just, I love a day when I have nothing to do and nowhere to go except write. And I got my wish. Um, but if I'm being entirely truthful, I have to say that for a couple of months, I found it so hard to uh, focus. And I've heard a lot of other writers say the same thing. I just would sit down at my computer in the morning and, and you know, even if I had a plan, I, I found myself looking at my email and then I'd look at Facebook and then I'd start doing some research and, you know, get off on something entirely uh, separate from what I was trying to do. And I just found it really, really hard to focus. But I think I've, I've kind of got into the rhythm now and um, it, it does simplify things in that I'm, I'm really home all the time. Yeah. So the only thing that worries me is the fact that, um, that on Tuesday I'm picking up a new puppy. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure how that's going to work with writing. So I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have a little wiggly puppy in my lap for a lot of the time. And she's going to be very distracting. Um, let me just say to, to Kyra that, that we go to Lindy's a lot because we, we live in Delaware, Ohio, which is just north of Columbus. So, so I know exactly where you mean, and it's a wonderful restaurant. Oh, that's great. That's so funny. What a coincidence. Yeah, yeah it really is. Yeah. It's a small world, smaller than you would think. Um, Kristen, have, have you had any like creative, creativity gaps or laps or what, what, with you? Um, Fine. Um, I, I, you know, it's like Connie said, one of those be careful what you wish for kind of things where you finally get all the time in the world with no distractions and then you can't move. And that did happen to me as well. I, um, I, I actually, to get myself going, um, went and uh, found, sought out some writing teachers I'd worked with in the past and just, you know, we took a class and, you know, anything that gave me a deadline um, was really sort of what I needed to, to reboot. Um, but always when I'm hitting a wall, I always just get up and go out and maybe go for a walk or um, because I write the candle maker mystery books, I really like lighting a candle. I find that that actually is very inspiring and I um, recommend it. Um, and from the food angle, um, my books are now, because of COVID, um, kind of vintage because um, Stella's favorite place to go for coffee is a place called The Bean, which was a, re was, was a real place. And in this last book, 15 Minutes of Flame, we have a new character, Clemmy, who's so fun. And she, like, I love her so much. But sadly, The Bean closed in the spring because um, of the pandemic and various other things and it just uh it was time i guess but um i used to love to take a break and go there and get a coffee and just imagine stella sitting in her little chair and having a drink with friends and a coffee with friends um so i do miss that um and uh, i don't know cheryl you you keep your places alive after they've gone i don't know if i'm gonna do that i think i want to honor that they're gone i don't know <laughs> um, for um, for Hannah, I know I'm much more involved in social media, reluctantly, but there it is. Um, how has that changed for you? I mean, your your ocean away. Um, you know, for me, I have to be honest. I I have found a lot more support in the writing community because of this, because it's it's forced me to go more into the virtual space. 
um, like doing BoucherCon, I would, in, that's in Sacramento, it would have been hard for me to have got there this time um, if it hadn't been for COVID. But I've also been taking um, a lot more sort of interest in all the, anything that's a virtual conference, some of the live uh, Facebook kind of events, you know, at bookstores, I've been able to listen to all those sorts of things that have been recorded, you know, whether it's Murder by the Book in in Houston or The Poison Pan, my favorite two stores. And so I really enjoyed doing that. So I felt a lot more connected to the actual writing community than I did before. So I've, I've actually really liked it. Um, and that, yeah, but I, I, I actually got to go to bloody Scotland. Yeah, exactly. So I've, I've become a lot more active, actually. But I, I, I just like other people have mentioned, I did find it difficult to focus to start with and then I realized that actually I'm really unsociable cow anyway mm -hmm. so for me not to have to go anywhere or make an excuse or say I have to go somewhere it's been quite nice which sounds really bad um, Barbara how have uh, virtual events like this helped you kind of keep your connection to readers yeah, I guess that's been one of the blessings in disguise of this entire situation. Maine is quite large by East Coast standards and quite rural by East Coast standards. And I've spent the last several summers driving to the back of beyond to various libraries in Maine. So it's been wonderful to be able to stay at home and chat with readers. And I've been able to go to several book discussion groups too, which is tremendously fun. People who've moved their meetings online and therefore can uh, invite me. I've also gone as a reader to a lot more events um, when I don't have to, um, get in my car and find parking and, and do all that. So I've appreciated it both as a writer and as a reader. Um, I really would love to see you all and I'd really love to have a drink with every one of you in the bar. Um, and I can't wait till we can do that again. But there are parts of this that I hope we hold on to. I agree. I, I would love to hug everybody, every single one, sometimes twice. Um, Tara, um, what of your what about your daily writing rhythm? Has that been affected or or what's what's up? Yeah, my kids call me the crazy writing woman now uh, because it's I think for me it was um, you know right when it all shut down and, and I have four kids and they all are living their twenty something lives and they all came back home all of a sudden and so it was like reconstituted family and you know scavenging for toilet paper and all of that. But then after all of that kind of settled. I've found uh, writing just to be such a wonderful escape. And um, so, I mean, I'd love to do it. I've been waiting my whole life to do this full time. So now I'm like up here too much, I think in my office, my kids are like, stop writing to come do something. So I, I've um, actually been too productive. I think uh, I have, I finished two novels during the pandemic and my agents are like, stop. So maybe I should be writing series so I can do that but I you know so for me it's been a weird thing I, I had the opposite of the uh, COVID pandemic problem I just uh, I've been writing a lot so anyway it's I, been I'm very social and I'm at every conference in the world it's, you know just two two a month would not be unusual so I've written two books so it, it's pretty good for that <laughs> I mean, I agree. It's it's a lot faster to, to be on one of these than to fly someplace. Although, yeah, yeah, I miss people too. I, I'm actually a people person, but I am a crazy writing. So, uh, before we open up for questions, what I'd like each of you to do is please, um, in just like 30, 30 seconds, tell us what's next for you and where we can find you on the interwebs. So, um, Connie. My third book in the Kate Hamilton series is coming out uh, in, on June 8th, and it's called The Art of Betrayal. And I am currently writing uh, the fourth, having a wonderful time. One of the benefits of uh, writing is that you can travel when you can't travel. So I, I look forward to going to my little Suffolk village every day when I, when I go to my computer. Um, the, the working title of the fourth one is The Burden of Memory, although I'm sure they'll change it. Um, you can find me at my website, which is connieberry.com. I have a monthly newsletter. You can sign up for that. 
I write for two online blogs, um, Misdemeanors and Writers Who Kill. So I'm periodically on those. I'm on Facebook and Instagram as Connie Berry Author. I'm on Twitter as Connie C. Berry, and I'm also on Goodreads and Pinterest, but not all that much. Uh, Kristen? I, um, so I am, I have three um, new ideas I'm working on for um, um, the Nantucket Candlemaker Mysteries. No launch date for, um, for those. And when I hit this leave button, I'm going back to a page behind this, which is um, a new, an idea for a new series that I'm excited about and is um, keeping me at my desk excited and typing away rather than worrying about, you know, out there. Uh, so that, that's very energizing. And um, I will be, uh, you can find me on my website, kristenbrecker.com. Um, Facebook and Instagram are kristenbreckerbooks.com or, or Kristen Brecker Books. And um, I'm also going to be on the October 27th, the um, book choice for the Once a Month Book Club on Facebook, the Cozy Mystery Once a Month Book Club. And wonderfully, I just met a woman who worked at Kensington, which is my publisher, um, who now makes candles. So we're going to do a little promotion during that um, with the candles. Morgan Howell. Oh. It's, it's Morgan. Yeah. Yeah, Morgan. yeah, Morgan's great. Yeah. Wonderful. So yeah. We'll do that. And um, also in October, and I feel like maybe I'm not alone here doing that, the uh, Halloween Murder on the Beach event, um, uh, also on Facebook. And that is on October 23rd. Um, so much fun. I hope I see you all at other events. Thank you. Um, Hannah? Oh, um, it's getting really dark here, by the way, because I'm mm -hmm. in England. <laughs> so um, I'm sorry. I know I'm sort of fading away. And if I put a light on, I'm not sure if I'm going to be too bright. So if I see that, I think that's is that better. I don't, I don't really know, because I know some people have texted and said about my glasses. So I apologize for that. Um, actually, I think it isn't so good. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> me um so yes i have um this uh, uh seventh um um honey church hall book comes out in the uk in november called diva of death at honey church hall um the sixth honey church hall comes out in the usa tidings of death at honey church hall uh, that's out at, in a couple of weeks, but I think some people have already bought it from the UK because it came out a, a year early. Um, I have Danger at the Co, which is the second Island Sisters Mysteries coming out next August. And then I'm writing the eighth, um, oh wait, or is it the seventh? Uh, anyway, I'm writing another Honey Church Hall. So uh, I'm being pretty busy. Um, I'm trying to do social media. I am really making an effort. I'm not very good at it. Um, I'm on Facebook, um, Hannah Denison Books, um, Instagram, which I quite like Instagram, actually. See lots of my dogs, Hannah Denison Books, and also Twitter, Hannah L. Denison. So. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Barbara? Hi. Uh, Jane Darrowfield and the Mad Woman Next Door comes out October 27th, exclusively in print, exclusively from Barnes & Noble for one year. So it goes into wide release October 2021. And Shucked Apart, the ninth book in the main Clambake Mystery Series comes out end of February 2021. It's about uh, oyster farming on the Damariscotta River in Maine. Uh, you can find me at my website, mainclambakemysteries.com, and that has links to all my social media. You can sign up for my newsletter there. And I also blog, uh, I'm a founding member of the Wicked Authors blog, and would love to see you there. Thanks, Barb. Um, Kara, Hi. where can we find you on the interweb? You can find me, okay, so it's Kara, K-A-I-R-A, -A, and then Ruda, like Gouda. So that's easy. So that's where you find me on everything. You probably can't pronounce it, but that's where I am. So Instagram, Twitter, um, all that stuff. I'm usually just under my name. Um, you can find me for the next two weeks helping my husband try to win a really nasty re-election campaign. He's a congressman in the States. 
Um, Everybody vote. Early, Rita. <laughs> and we have a really tough race. So that's, um, that's been fun. So usually the whole month of October, went, well, this is only his, this will be his hopefully second term. So this is all kind of new. But anyway, when I'm not doing that. Um, um, I'm hunkered down writing, but uh, the next wife, and my next book is out May 1st of next year. And then the following book is called Somebody's Home. And that is out in January of 2022, which is odd to say, but yeah. So there thanks. you have it. Thanks, thanks. Um, now on to questions, and I'm going to read them from the chat. Um, this will be a, a really a good eye test. Um, from Terry Shepard, um, how do authors with two series deal with writing them both? At which point in the first series do they start the second? Do they alternate writing the books in each? In other words, you know, how, how do you cope? And, how do you call Barbara? <laughs> <laughs> Not well, I must say. I have a number of friends who write multiple series and it's like a breeze for them, or it certainly appears to be. I am a slow writer, so this has been a struggle for me. But as I mentioned, I actually wrote Jane Darrowfield, Professional Busybody, before I started the main Clam Bake series. So it was kind of sitting there in inventory, um, and I pulled it out and read it, and it was, of course, horrible. and harder to fix than if I had started from scratch. But I only write one book at a time. I really need to be focused. So I write them serially. I have two series going on and I just I just have spaghetti for brains. I can work on one book in the morning and <laughs> another book in the afternoon and and you know nope. keep them both almost straight. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody else write multiple series? I think just oh Hannah. You're muted. No, that's it. <laughs> um, oh yeah. No, actually, I, I find that if they're in different stages of uh, development, I can do two. So if I'm doing like copy edits or line editing in one series, then I can create on the other series. But I can't create both at the same time from like from scratch, if you know what I mean. Because I find that I seem to keep copying my storylines without sub subconsciously, um, which has been a bit. Um, was a bit worrying when I and I think oh I've done the same thing even though it's a completely different series with different characters so I have to watch that but yeah it's hard it's hard it's hard and that that should be the takeaway it is devilishly hard no matter how you approach it once you get into that second series so uh, from Pamela Reese you think there is a critical mass in terms of size of town if the intention is to write a series. Um, she's obviously um, a wannabe writer and ho hopefully soon to be. I don't want to fall into the trap of having the person being mentioned for the first time actually being the criminal. So how, how, big, how big does your town need to be? Um, anybody? Or I'll call. Um, I'm not sure. Barbara. I'm not. Am I? Yeah. I'm not sure the size of town is critical. It's actually the opposite. Um, so if you're in a big city, you need to be able to create a community um, the way, say, Cleo Coyle does in Greenwich Village. Um, so I think it's really the focus is on community building and world building. I'm not sure the actual size matters, although I did turn down a series um, on Block Island in, in Rhode Island because I thought that with only 50 people there in the winter that I would run out of people to kill. Oh, what a problem. But that, yeah, that is. <laughs> That's um, one of the reasons why I like Nantucket because people come and so you can kill them. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like that about St. Petersburg, Florida as well, which is where one of my books is set. You know, boy, we get a lot of tourists and, and then they go away. <laughs> Laguna Beach too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Laguna Beach. Yeah, and, and one other aspect is that when when you have your, your main cast or characters, um, chances are none of them will turn into murderers suddenly that, that nobody knew about. But 
uh, what is interesting to me is that each one of those characters has a past and a, and a history. And um, so right now in the book that I'm writing, I've taken one of my characters that was a, a fairly main character, but not the main character. And I now have built a story around her past and things that come back from her past to, to cause problems there. And there are any number of stories now um, with just with the main characters that I've already established. Okay, from um, Sarah McBride, how do you establish the feeling of a large cast of characters to fill out a town without getting lost in a large cast of characters? And <laughs> that's something I just adore. I, I love a really large cast of characters. How do you guys feel? I can answer that one. Um, I, I actually am the opposite. I prefer a smaller cast of characters because um, I'm interested in the dynamics of the characters rather than the, um, I think my, my, my mysteries are, are very much character driven by the way they react to a certain situation. So often the actual murder itself isn't the focal point, it's how they're characters are reacting to that and how secrets, you know, like you were saying earlier about giving your characters uh, sort of some secret in their past, that all comes out to the fore. I think with, um, I don't know how, how what you would call a large cast of characters, but I tend to put a cap on 10. I don't know, what does other people think? If you're having a whole cast, but I normally focus just on on a, a, no more than 10 main characters. Well, I'm not saying I usually have 15. Yeah. But, but See my characters in different sort of buckets in a way to kind of keep track of them. So there's family, first in the case of Stella, there's her candle store, uh, her, her, her students who she teaches, they're the, um, um, the friends and that she's who she's grown up with. And so you know, as a puppeteer, that's sort of a way in which I can try to um, keep track as they grow. And I think some stand out in some books more than others. And so they come, you know, to the foreground and back because you can't have the same amount of attention on everybody in every book, I don't think. Right. So um, from uh, Anne Ripetto to, to any panelists, do you make maps, floor plans, drawings, etc., to keep track of your imaginary or my imagined places. I, I actually wish that I had um, <laughs> talked my publisher into putting one of those maps in the front because I love maps and I, and I love books that have maps in them and I actually have both my village in Suffolk and my island in the Inner Hebrides totally mapped out. So I, I know where all the roads are. I know where the houses are. I know who lives in them and I know who lived in them before them. And um, so I, you know, I know that when I say turn right, it's, it's correct. Um, but no one else will because I, have, because I don't have a map in my books, but I wish I did. Okay. Um from uh, Diane S. Now that your locations are set, how much on-site on research do you do as you're developing your next story? Do you go and walk around town? Do you rely on Google Maps? Do you drive, drive a golf cart? So how do you do it? I've done all of that, but I would also say one of my favorite things to do <laughs> because I have family there and my, my character loves family. My dad and I will drive around after uh, I've written some stuff and just make sure that everything fits. All of the details that I put in the scene match um, what you might find there. And I have this one moment where we, we broke onto the um, one of the golf courses at night. Um, in uh, my second book, Murder Makes Sense, she does break onto a golf course at one point. And it was so fun to feel like Stella for a moment, but also 
I had never imagined or known that this beam of light from one of the lighthouses keeps flying around. And it was genius. And I would never have come up with it had I not gone there myself. And so, of course, that became a wonderful um, beacon for the character during that particular scene. Fabulous. Uh, Connie, how about you and your Hello. 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 Before pandemic, we were traveling to the UK once or twice a year, and we would stay in um, self-catering cottages in Suffolk. And there really isn't any um, substitute for actually being there. We did the same thing uh, with my book in Scotland and um, traveled up the road that my protagonist had to travel right along Loch Ness, um, stayed, in a, stayed in a castle. Um, yeah, so we had a trip to Suffolk planned for October and obviously that didn't happen. So I'm really bummed out about that. So now until we can travel again, I have to do it online, but yeah, you, you really need to be there. You, you need to be familiar with um, your setting, I believe. Okay. This is the last question and I want an answer from each one of you. Um, the answer for me is yes. Um, do you keep, series Bibles? If so, what does your setting section include? And yes, I keep a Bible and I print out maps and, and I mark uh, where my characters are going to be. So uh, Connie, what do you do? I keep uh, a big notebook for every book and I have um, sections that include things like character sketches, um, I have a, a way that I keep track of scenes and chapters and all of that. And then I have photographs that I find. I have a whole section on photographs. I have a history on um, it. All of my books have to do with antiques, high-end type antiques. So I, you know, I keep a lot of information on that, on policing in, 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 in England, um, local history. So just depending on what the book is, I keep a lot of information and that does come in handy because you do forget. <laughs> Kristen? Do you no, keep a Bible? <laughs> I'm worried. Um, I'm more of a visual. I like to, I go around the island. I take photos of everything and that's how I sort of, you know, refer back. I, I also think just getting back to the theme of this panel, um, about spaces and places, they become a character themselves. And so, and often they're, my characters are organically come from, from those places. You know, this new character, Clemmy, I mentioned at the Bean, it worked that she could come up, you know, become a character because Stella was always at the Bean, that kind of a thing. So for me, um, the places themselves and photographing them are really helpful. Um, Hannah? I um, I do the same thing as um, that. I have a big Bible. I have a big Bible of every every single book um, that I have because I use a lot of repetitive descriptions and settings because one is set at a country house and a country house estate, and then of course my fictional island, um, which has which took me a long time to build that world. So I make sure that I have kept all the details, maps, pictures, photographs go there when I can, do the same thing. So yeah, to get the essence of the of the setting is really important to do that. So yeah, I do. Um, Barbara? So I did or have attempted to keep a Bible, but I'm finding nine books and three novellas in that you just never know what you're going to reuse in terms of setting or peripheral characters or so recently I took all the word files from uh, nine novels and three novellas and put them in, smush them into one file so that I can use the search function because I'm very good at figuring out what word to search on to find out things that like, um, you know, some minor character in a previous book, how much did I really describe them 
if they're going to be a major character in a coming book. It's not an issue for me because it takes so long to write them, but I do get emails from people who read them back to back to back to back, which always terrifies me when people do that, um, about consistency. So this new writer hack of putting everything in one file is my answer. Good. Um, Kara, last one. Yeah, no, um, I. <laughs> when you're doing standalones, you can use the same setting, but maybe. Uh -huh. right? So yeah, that's. I mean, I I'm not organized, so that whole fiber that would like freak me out too to try to remember like ten books back who said what. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of lucky that way. I think. Okay, um, we've run over just a teeny bit, but I want to thank all of these wonderful panelists for their charm, wit, intelligence, and especially patience. Also a big virtual hug to the organizers for this absolutely amazing event. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Everybody. Bye.